Gentlemen, welcome and congratulations on the film. A well-deserved standing ovation. Uh, Liev, I'd like to start with you, not just because you wanted to be introduced as writer-director Tom McCarthy, <laughs> but also because I think it feels like the natural way to start. And I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, Marty Baron's entrance into the globe and into the film is so natural. But I'm wondering if, in approaching the, the performance, the notion that he was the one to be able to look at this issue from another perspective, because he was, as Gardamedian says, the outsider looking in, coming at it from a fresh point of view, how that affected your performance, how you kind of internalized that and brought that out? It was very difficult because this ensemble of actors had, all know each other relatively well, and um, some of us are very, very old, close friends, and um, we were a very tight-knit group right away. Um, I guess it was odd for me, you know, working on Ray Donovan and, and playing a Southie. It was odd for me being oh, the only bring that guy. up. <laughs> Golden Globes tomorrow night. Um, <clears throat> It was odd for me being the only. <laughs> it was odd for me being the only guy who wasn't from Boston, so I tried to work off of that. Mm -hmm. I tried to, um, you know, and having met with Marty at the post, uh, I, I, I sensed he was very uncomfortable. Yeah. That was not an easy time for him, and so it was. Uh, I guess it, to answer your question, for me it was. Um, uh, trying to, I'm putting this in very simplistic actor terms, trying to keep to myself as much as possible uh, while respecting the boundaries of others and authority, mm -hmm. which felt, you know, I don't know how really to talk about how I do things. I sort of, I met Marty and I kind of felt that's what was going on. And I didn't have a very big part, you know. I thought I should have a much bigger part. <laughs> I really, I, 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 cause I read the thing and I said, now wait a minute, this is me. This should all be me. And Tom, didn't, I told you on that the first day, I'm not lying. I said, well, what the hell is going on with this script? This should be me. And, uh, you know, once we started working, I realized that Tom was going after something much more intelligent and restrained, which in a way, reflected how these people work. And that quickly became our, I say me, I can't speak for this jerk, but I think <laughs> that quickly became the way that we started to think about how to work on the project, was to be as generous as possible with each other and to not, uh, uh, not mine the thing for performances. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because the recessiveness that is part of Marty's character, in fact, you'd think that in some ways, Josh Singer had said that actually in a, in a previous Q&A, was that you, know, you could see this as the, as the story of an editor who's going in, but in fact, the recessiveness that your performance shows, one of the terrific aspects of it, sort of shows how intelligent all of this is going to be and how it's going to be very much a, a life of the mind type of thing for all of these, for all these people, yeah. I, and I think the, what's smart about the script is to keep it away from Marty. Keeps, it, keeps everyone within focus. The opposite, though, of recessive, I think, John, obviously, is Ben Bradley. And, and part of the, the beauty of your performance is that you see a guy who's always sort of strategizing. I think he's, all, he's the one who sort of recognizes when doors need to be closed, when to push, when to pause, when to pull a little bit. A guy who's got it in his blood, how to tell the story, and when to maybe go against the grain. In meeting with Ben and in approaching it, did you find that there was sort of a, a level that he had to walk between pushing too far and saying, no, you can't, you're going to sue the church? You can't sue the church. Was there a moment when he had to kind of be back and forth a little bit? Um, well, you know, he had been in that position for a while, and they, um, they had written a bunch of stories about Father Porter and priests that had preceded Father Gagan, the, the priest in the opening sequence. Um, and and you have to remember the the the, the readership of the Globe, <coughs> excuse me, was fifty three is maybe still fifty three percent Catholic. I mean, it's the largest archdiocese in the country. Uh, it's a lot of Catholics, um, and they had pushed this story to the limit, or so had been told by the publishers. The archdiocese Lake Street was like, "We'll bring down the wrath of God." You know, if if you persist in this. So when Marty came in, 
they had been there before. And, it, and, and the thing is, as, as Ben would say, is they didn't have the documents. They didn't have the, the, the evidence that, that, that Marty calls for, which is to prove that it's systemic. That, so, so it would have just been another, oh, here's another bad apple. And, and so, yeah, he was, there, there was definite and palpable pressure from the, the, the city, the archdiocese, the paper, the, 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 you know, this paper itself. Um, but he's not a guy who's afraid of throwing elbows, and he's not a guy who's afraid of being unlikable and pushing people and cheerleading when he needs to. He really is um, someone who, who um, despite all his rough edges, uh, maybe socially, mm -hmm. has universal respect from all the reporters and, and the staff of the Boston Globe to this day for, for, for the way he, for his leadership and the way he sort of steward, you know, his stewardship and the way he shepherded this story through. So, um, yeah, I think he was smart enough to not be rattled by that pressure and to allow the people writing the story to 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 do it thoroughly and not publish before it was finished. You were raised in Boston. Did that inform your performance at all? Did you kind of feel like you, you had a sense of what these people were about and what the story was about going into it? Uh, yeah. I mean, I read it... Uh, yeah, I mean they got, they they really got it right. I mean it wasn't um, it wasn't about what it sounds like to be from Boston. Mm -hmm. It 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 was really you know there was restraint in the writing. There was an ensemble nature. I knew that uh, I don't know. I I think I knew you were involved and Keaton and Ruffalo and as Leah said, we've all known each other for a, a while. Um, but yeah, I grew up uh, in Newton, Massachusetts. I was an altar boy, and the, you know, went to all boys Catholic high school. And and there would be priests that would disappear in the middle of the week, and you'd be like, "Whatever happened? What happened to Father uh, Driscoll?" And they'd go, "He's not coming back." And 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 you know, you'd there'd be a few jokes flying around and rumors, and and then that would sort of go away. And but there were there was that stuff all the time. And no one ever was encouraged to continue that line of questioning. So so. The script was very well vetted in in the in the the fabric or the sound or uh, and the, the 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 sort of conscious Boston element. So yeah, it felt very um, instantaneous. I, I I got the call and then called Ben and that I think I got his email from Tom about the neck. I called him right back, got his email and then went to Boston the next day and met with Ben. Forgive me for indulging him, because it's never a good idea to indulge him, but <laughs> I just want to say that one of the things that, there's so many things happening in this story, and one of the things that I really love, uh, one of the nuances of John's performance is that what you don't, because it, does, it doesn't, there's so many elements to our story that we couldn't follow it that much, but it, as I watched the film and I watched John dealing with the fact that Ben, by most accounts, was the person who was supposed to take that job. And I thought that was... Take your job. Yeah, Marty yeah. walks into a paper that's that is supposed to, by all accounts, be taken over by Ben Bradley Jr. Right. Yeah. And that nuance in his performance. I think. Yeah. Right. It's he's he's aware of it. He's aware of sort of being usurped a little bit, but also being you know being the good the level lieutenant. of discomfort yeah. and the caution around all of that for me is tempered by that yeah. anger and resentment that he's. It's a it's a it's a pretty good performance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And another very good performance. Very Michael, I want to uh, just say to you that in seeing this... <laughs> in seeing this film several times now, there are two moments when people sort of go from being intellectually on the edge of their seats to, to sort of gasping a little bit and drying their eyes. And one is when Mark Ruffalo says, it's time, and such a dramatic moment. And the other is when you tear up and when you're walking through the park uh, with Rachel McAdams. In some ways, if this if this story, if what the spotlight reporters were doing was for about the was a battle for hearts and souls, in some ways your character was the battleground. Tell us how you approached it a little bit, and if you met with any of the survivors, or how you how you approached the role. Yeah, um, I'd also like to put in that sort of battleground Neil Huff and uh, Jamie LeBlanc, who yes, are so, the, so phenomenal um, as the other two survivors. Uh, 
Patrick McSorley is no longer with us, but Bill Saviano is very much still doing work. Um, so I, when I got the audition, I read uh, the few articles I could find about Joe online. He's referenced in the first Globe article, but he doesn't use his name, and then they follow up with him in 2011. Uh, I also found an article that said his nickname uh, is Princess. That's what his friends call him, so immediately I loved him. Um, and, uh, and then I, uh, once I got the part, I realized he was uh, very in involved and very willing to meet with me. Uh, we talked on the phone for about an hour and a half, and then I went up to Boston for a fitting, and I stayed the night and spent five hours with him the next day. And um, the man I was talking to now is very different than the man that talks to, who talked to Sasha back then. So uh, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what his what led up to that moment when he spoke for the first time to the Globe. Um, and that was a very scary moment for him and it took a lot of bravery and um, he's done a lot of, they, they call themselves survivors because they really are. They have to fight for everything to uh, overcome this. And um, the man I was meeting with had done all that work. The man who talked to Sasha might not have. So I was trying to figure out what led up to that point. Um, and we had a great candor. He was really generous and very um, open with me, which I think informed my performance in ways that I'm not even sure of. Um, and that's, that's pretty much how I handled it. I just kind of talked to him, tried to get his essence. Um, he doesn't really have a very thick Boston accent, only when he says Anne Margaret, uh, <laughs> which he says a lot. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, and, he's, but he, and he's taller. Um, we have similar... Uh, similar coloring and things like that, but we have a, a, an essence uh, that is similar. We have similar likes. We both love Margot Martindale. We could talk about her for a long time. <laughs> and uh, I went to Catholic school for 12 years, and I was Christian of the Year seven years in a row, and I, which is actually a thing on Long Island. Uh, and I just, I, I understood his situation. I understood, um, I could empathize with his pain. And his um, generosity and openness really helped inform the performance, I believe. Yeah, because Phil Saviano is, the, is one of the survivors, the first one that we see who really comes at it from an angular point of view. Joey really is, he's much softer, he's much more wounded. All of his emotions are still on the surface, and it's very important to see that, that disparity, isn't it? Yeah, and the other thing that's important with him um, is the real Joe, obviously, is an incredibly funny man. He's very funny, and something he said to me very early on in our conversations was, I always knew I was in trouble if I didn't have my sense of humor. And Tom and Josh beautifully put little moments of humor uh, in that scene, yeah. and I think if they didn't, it just would be unbearable. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really hard mm -hmm. to watch, not saying, you know, it's hard yeah. to watch, it's a hard story to hear. Um, and his humor helped, uh, helped inform yeah. that sort of situation, and I'm glad it was there, and I'm glad he shared it with me. We've mentioned Tom McCarthy and Josh Singer a few times. Let's give them a round of applause, because as co-writers, and Tom is the director. Absolutely. Paul, I said at the top that it's a, this film is a buffet of ensemble acting, and it really is. And I, and I mean that from not only these terrific actors, but all the way through to that opening scene, the cop who's sort of disgusted and dismissive about what's going to happen, when he, what arraignment he says, to, to all of the side performers, to Len Cario, who's terrific, and, uh, and Jamie Sheridan. What was the casting process like to flesh out the tapestry here? Um, well, Carrie Barden, my business partner and I have done, well, Carrie prior to me, but have done all of Tom's movies with him. So it's, we have developed a kind of shorthand in terms of knowing the kinds of actors he responds to. Um, so we read this uh, a, a, a couple years, a few, four or five years ago, I think, and then he went off and did another movie called The Cobbler, and then he came back to do this when it sort of came back together. Um, we start the process, you know, by the, making the dreaded lists of, you know, how to fit this all together. And then Tom goes through those and we have lots of talks. Um, in terms of the, you know, the rest of it, it's, it's actually sort of lucky to have that shorthand because I, I, happily <laughs> and lazily for me, you know, I, can, I don't have to really have to bring in like 10 people, you know, for a certain role because I kind of have a good idea of what Tom's gonna look for. And we do talk a bit ahead of time. It was interesting, in this movie, it was all real people. We didn't, and I've worked on a bunch of things with real people where they, the studio will put photographs, you know, of the real people. And we didn't do any of that. I never knew what 
Marty Baron was like until I saw the movie and then saw Liev and him staying together at Toronto, and I was like, what? Because it was so uncanny. And so, so that's the sort of the, one of the more fun parts yeah. of helping put this together. Um, and in terms of the, just logistically, the Boston, so it's not terribly interesting, but there's a Boston casting director and a Toronto casting director. I watched everything online. I didn't go there physically. And then Tom and I would talk. I'd say, this is who I like. We'd go by email, because he was prepping, I guess. And then he would look, and we'd sort of make choices that way. I, I can't be the first one to say this, though, but I can absolutely see John Slattery being the son of Jason Robards from All the President's Men. <laughs> that is a link I see absolutely. I am his son. Right there. <laughs> That's why it's so evident. <laughs> So you did cast a little bit out of Boston and then, and then some out of New York. Did you do Correct. both? Yeah, yeah okay. there was one, Michael mentioned, the, the third survivor. Neil Huff is Phil Salviano, who's the guy with the box. Um, and uh, Patrick McSorley, who has a kid on the swing. He was, a, he was one actor who, we did actually audition a fair number of people in New York, and we just heard lots of sort of kind of close accents, but just, yeah. and Carolyn Pickman, who did the casting in Boston, found Jimmy LeBlanc, and we were all like, yeah. That, that guy has to come from Boston, and so. Yeah. And a lot of those yeah. cops, too, to get that sort of flavor. Yeah, to get flavor. that, right, that Boston flavor. Leah and John, what were some of the hardest scenes to film, or maybe even to research? Because I know research was such a crucial part of this film for all of the actors, not only talking with their real-life counterparts, but in diving into it, what were some of the toughest scenes or toughest bits that you, uh, that you recall? Um, you know, from the beginning, we, we, we sat around a table, and we talked about... Um, how much information the audience needed, you know, in a particular scene. The, the, the process for, for Josh and Tom um, was, went something like they would, you know, they went up to, to interview the, the, the principal journalists a couple of times over a couple of years, you know, at least twice, three times, four times. And then they would sort of cherry pick, you know, oh, that's a good line, someone said this in that moment, or someone said this on the telephone, and they would compress the, those lines into scenes which weren't, wasn't necessarily the most organic way to construct a scene. So we would sit around the table and, and, and you know, pare it down, and, 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 then, and then that would continue on to the, the, on the day. You know, you'd be in the room, and there was one day in particular um, that... Uh, is a scene at the end, near the end of the movie, when when it becomes clear that um, Keaton's character Robbie had missed this list of of of, of names, and that was um, I mean we must have rehearsed this thing for or you know and batted it back and forth for four or five hours. Two days. Yeah. Well, I mean in the in the in the room, but then we came back onto the we came back into the room. We did, we didn't shoot before lunch, and we you know it, and it became really about everybody saying, well, I don't want to make a speech. I don't, I don't think we need to say that twice. And, and, you know, making sure the audience knew where you were in the movie, making sure that everybody was with it, but that nobody was making a speech, no one was grandstanding. It was really sort of, to my mind, the actors were playing the same roles that the journalists played in telling the story, which was no one wanted to get in the way of the story. He was making the speech in that scene, and he kept resisting, said, it seems like a speech, and you can talk about this. But it was like, it was... You know, you just wanted to, to, to fulfill your function as accurately as possible in your character's telling of the story. It's also, it, it's so beautifully constructed, too, as a workplace film. You know, it's something that we also, in the 1930s and 40s, you'd see a lot of. Now, you, you almost a half expect, because we're trained to, oh, this is going to be a scene where we see them at home. You see that a little bit. You see Brian Darcy James at home a little bit, but you don't see their family see Sasha with, with her husband a little bit, but it really is their life, is their work, and, and that's the focus of this film. To go off of that would be to lose the focus, right? Liv, I mean... It, yeah, say, yeah. I, I, think, I think John described it beautifully. The, the, what happens is when you start to get into a rapport with each other as actors, <clears throat> um, it, once the workplace begins to kind of reflect the ensemble, which we had gotten to by that point, we kind of knew who we were and we were interacting well, and, and to speak to your point, it was very much about work. And anything that felt either expositional or grandstanding got in the way of that, because you knew these characters didn't spend time doing that. They didn't sit around making speeches <coughs> about stumbling in the dark. And so what was important for us to do, 
is to trust in the process with Tom and Josh and say, okay, you want me to make a speech here. I can make this speech, but then I have to trust that you're going to handle with restraint the scenes in the first and second act. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. That way you can afford a speech in that scene. So it goes to their credit because I think that speech is a little much. Which is what he kept saying when we were shooting it. I do. I think. I mean, I mean. I just know that Marty wouldn't like do that. Like it seems like a speech, <clears throat> but but he had the smart. You know, you cut works. around it, and it, you know, he cut to you just enough, and and so the speech. It he stays really off worked. me. I mean, he goes great. over my ear for a lot of it. He spends a lot of it reactive. Yeah. And the other thing is, he cut a lot of Marty from the early part of the movie, so it mm -hmm. actually plays. Right. So yeah. suddenly Marty is talking, and you think like, well, that's right. a lot of talking for right. Marty Baron. <laughs> And you go, right. Yeah, right. But that speech, I have to say, I mean, being in that room, you know, that was a great room to be in for, you know, it was really fun to work with all those actors in that room at the same time. And that speech on that day, I mean, he had, I don't know how many times, 25 times, I don't know how many times we did it in various shots. It was never the same, never the same, always sort of, of a piece, but never the same. I mean, it was like a, it was great to watch. And it was very small, it was always very in the same size. It wasn't like, oh, let me try one while I'm yelling and screaming. He knew the sort of world he wanted to be in. He was, it was a great, it was a great lesson in film acting. Are you talking about me or Tom? I'm talking about you. Oh, it's important to <laughs> delineate. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about uh, Tom. <laughs> No, but I mean, it was yeah. it was it was a real give and take too, because, you know, that was a it was not an easy day, and that was um, everyone had. You know, you felt like you wanted to protect the character you were playing. You 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 felt like you wanted to tell the story. Tom is not somebody who who is a pushover. <laughs> I mean, you know, if 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 your if your opinions differ, the best argument will win. Um, and uh, and he vigorously, vigorously defended his version of this thing, and s as did everyone else. And no one in that room was a pushover, particularly. No. Um, that was the hardest day. And I, but I, and the other thing that I well, that I loved about that day, just to add to John's point, is it was very apparent by that day that every actor in that room was extraordinarily proud to be playing who they were playing, mm -hmm. and they weren't going to let go. No. <laughs> but they also, to their credit, and I truly love this ensemble, and it's for this, and it's why I like this movie so much, and it's not just to talk about acting. They were also none of them going to grandstand. They were not one of them going to try and go for, I mean, you know, Mark's speech is a little flashy, so I'm going to give him some grief. <laughs> no. It's too much. It's too much. It's too much. It's too much. <laughs> but every single actor in that, I just watched... And I'm, I mean all of them. I watched very carefully, because they're all, I know them all. They're all pretty sophisticated actors, and they know how to steal a scene. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and every single one of them played that thing with remarkable restraint and really reminded me what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And that was a treat. Yeah. And that's why that speech is so earned, because in some ways, it's like not only does it thematically link, the movie is called Spotlight, the section is called Spotlight of the newspaper, and he's talking about stumbling in the dark, and it, and it alludes to that. But it also is because there is, le as you mentioned, less of, of Marty Baron in those first two-thirds of the movie. So when he suddenly emerges, in a, in a way, out of the shadows, narratively, he's, it's to bring that moment back. This is also a great moment to give a round of applause to the actors who are not here, but part of it. Michael Keaton, Mark Ruffalo, Rachel McAdams, Stanley Tucci, Brian Darcy James, all of them, absolutely terrific. Michael, in, in working with, with Rachel on, on that scene, since she is your, your connection to it, was there a give and take that you, the two of you had that made you feel in some ways like very safe in a way in those she scenes? She was great to me. I mean, we, you, you know, it, I'm not going to lie and say it wasn't intimidating to be yeah. cast in this movie with all of these people that I really enjoyed watching most of my life. Um, no, my, you know what I'm saying. Uh, but so, you know, I had a rehearsal with Rachel before we got to set in New York here. And uh, she was very generous. Tom was great. We kind of just, it was like table work. So I was comfortable with her in that way. But um, the night before we shot the, the big scene in uh, Boston, 
they rewrote it a, a great deal. <clears throat> In a great way. I mean, it wasn't a problem. It was just, it was a lot of changes that I learned and uh, got to the trailer very early in the morning and, and there comes in Rachel and she's like, I know they change your lines, do you want to run lines? And most of the lines in that scene are, are, are mine. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but they are. They, you know, it's mostly her listening, which is also a great um, hard thing to do. Uh, the hard skill. She's a great listener and very open and was very, uh, made me feel very safe. Um, so there was a give and take. You know, she would, uh, she, she was taking care of me. And, you know, being a journalist, and I have met and become friendly with the real Sasha, mm -hmm. Rachel does her unbelievable justice. And um, Sasha's a very empathetic person, mm -hmm. but also a very great journalist. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I don't think it would be easy for those men to open up with her if she was particularly emotional with them or anything like that. She was very professional. And Rachel was very professional with me. And then in between takes, she'd put her hand on my shoulder and, you know, give me a wink. And then she, we, she did her job, I did my job, and she was fantastic to me. I think uh, she's a great actress, obviously. Paul, I'm wondering, you said you've worked with Tom on, on so many of his films. I'm wondering if it's difficult to be a casting director for an act, for a director who's also an actor, who's got that background and uh, kind of knows what he wants in some ways, but also knows a little bit of what the, what the it's nuances actually, are. In, in, it's actually easier, I, I think. I mean, to the John's point about him not being a pushover, he's a little bit more, I think, demanding, I don't know about on set, in the, in the audition room, he, he, he works actors pretty hard when he tries to get what he, want, what he wants out of an audition. So in, in his case, it enhances it. I can't say that about every yeah. actor or director that yeah. I've worked with. <laughs> well, what, about, what about you guys as actors and working with Tom? Because he's got that background too. It doesn't, and obviously he's a terrific guy, but is there a level where you're just like, you know, you would have done it that way, but I'm doing it this way, but he's got such a sense of it being an actor himself. Was it easy in some ways to have that? that rapport with him, because he asks? He, he's not pushy yeah. uh, uh, about how, he doesn't direct, if what you're asking is, he doesn't direct like an actor. Right, that's like right. he doesn't play your part for you. He's, right. he's too smart for that. Right, right. He knows that's trouble. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, he's, uh, you know, Tom, we went, to, we went to drama school together, so I, I know Tom intimately as an actor. Um, he's a great director. Yeah. And, and uh, he really is. And yeah. I didn't know that till this movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, although I mean, I like Station Agent, but I didn't know how good he was. Um, and uh, he's 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 rigorous, and I, I think actors like rigor. I think good actors like rigor. They like to be put through their paces. Mm -hmm. And if you do it once, one way, mm -hmm. do it differently. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's film, and, yeah. and it gives him more room. It gives the editor more room. Yeah. Not everyone likes to do that, but right. I like to, and yeah. I think some of us like to. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about Michael Keaton because I think that in some ways the the the, the hinge of, on some of these emotions that we're talking about about the the easiness and the and the and the workplace uh, aspect of the story and yet also some of the nuances that are going on. There's so much going into Robbie's character as as the two of you approached him and approached that character. What what did anything change in your perception of your own characters in, in your own reading of the script in approaching Keaton and and sort of listening to Robbie's point of view? Um, I don't know if anything changed um, from my sort of point of view or the point of view of 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 the character, but you know he's he's just um, like the rest of the group. He's just someone that's just he he's very alive. He's not afraid to see what happens. Yeah. I mean, you know, you do all that work. You know, you do all the research. He's you know, spent time with with Robbie and 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 does all his homework as we all do. You know, it, it's interesting it, it, as a room full of people that have done a lot of work um, collectively. It really gets very basic. I mean, it, everybody does their homework, and and then you get in there and you try and figure out what the beats are on the scene and what you want to do, and you try to be as open as you can to what someone else is doing, and and so it's very it's very easy to. Um, to just, you know, listen and 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 it's it, it becomes very simple. Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, it you know, it gets sophisticated in there and it gets it gets crafty, you know. But I mean, 
you work with something like somebody like Michael, and he's wide open, and and um, and it sort of buoys you and carries you along. And if you if you just sort of bounce it back and forth, and it's um, it's great. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just want one thing about when he said what Tom is is rigorous. He is rigorous, as is everybody else. And what that does is it eliminates the self-consciousness, which everybody feels, no matter how much you've you've how far you've been around the block. Everybody's self-conscious. I mean, whether it's with Rachel or working with these guys, I mean, it's all. You want context, and you want you want to be relaxed. And between Tom and working with these guys, you're you forget about yourself. You forget how nervous you were. You're like, oh, let's just get down to work, and it becomes that. And that's really what you what you hope for as an actor. Could you go off script a lot, or were there moments when improv was sort of just natural, and you guys were able to kind of influence each I other? Made up, I made up my whole scene. <laughs> All of it. No, I didn't. <laughs> Liam, John, how about you guys? Were there moments when, when something just, you just said, you know what, this feels like I'm going to need to do this here, or this doesn't sound right anymore? Anything like that? Yeah, that would happen. Yeah. There were little bits. Yeah. You know, you find something... <clears throat> Like I, think, I think a lot of times with film acting, at least for me, the, the, the smallest things you find, they're really uninteresting to tell to an audience later on. But it's these very small things that take you down avenues that are interesting. And it doesn't have to be a big line. It's just a moment that suddenly you feel you've made a connection to something real in the character, and it works with that word that way. You know, there was so much work had gone into this script structurally. <clears throat> but I think we all felt like we were going to do our damnedest to deliver it mm -hmm. as close to how Tom and Josh wanted it as possible. Yeah, but then they'd come in and, you know, they'd be in looking at the monitor and they'd come in and go, okay, so, you know, it just occurred to me that you, you, we said this in the last scene, so it, skip that piece and just go straight to this line. and. And there was a, you know, a, a, a continuous kind of tailoring of each scene. You know, we have that. Let's try one without that line, or you know, some adjustment. That it's just a series of adjustments so that he, when he gets into the edit, that he has options. Mm -hmm. And it, it it went down that way with the script too. I feel like yeah, to be able to think on your feet, right, which is what they were yeah. doing in so many ways. Yeah. To wrap up, there are so many things going on in this film. There's obviously the emotional aspect of it. There's the, there's the church aspect to it. As somebody who's worked at a couple of newspapers, I can tell you, you guys get that newspaper guy-ness down perfect. Um, but, there's, but this film is very much a period film in some ways. It's some, a eulogy in some ways for the heyday of American journalism. This was sort of maybe the last era, 2001, 2002, when newspaper men could be allowed to do something like that. We're seeing a bit of a resurgence now in some ways because of this film. Um, but, uh, but I'm wondering if you guys were thinking about that as you were making the film, if you looked into it and said, this is an also, in, in many ways, um, a celebration for a great American tradition that is no longer that. Tom sent me the script, and I, I thought he was sending it to me as a friend to read. I didn't know there was a part, because he didn't say anything. And I read the script, and I was, I was just livid that I hadn't thought of it. Um, <laughs> I'm a big newspaper guy. I love newspapers, and I have children, and I am terrified of what they're going to experience in 15 years. But um, I was just overwhelmed by what a love letter it was to the printed word in journalism. And, and I told Tom that when I spoke to him. I said, you've really done something remarkable here at a time when it's really important to do it. And it was a film that I, you know, I said, oh, look, I'll go get coffee. What do you, I want to be, am I, what are you giving me this for? And he said, Marty Baron. And I was just like, oh, fuck, okay. <laughs> but I, I mean, it, to me, it, it's such an important, and, I, and I, you, know, so, you know, you go out and you sell films. I'm not selling a film. To me, this is a very important time for this story. And it's, I think it's very important that we focus our resources and we remember how essential uh, investigative journalism is to our society uh, and that we hold large corporations and powerful people uh, accountable. Uh, and without, uh, yeah. One more way that this film is incredibly essential. Ladies and gentlemen, Liev Schreiber, John Slattery, Michael Cyril Creighton, Paul Fay. The movie is Spotlight. Thank you.